Hello and welcome to Marketing Monday. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Brittany Sweeney. I am communications manager for the Livestock Conservancy and I could not be more excited to have some extra special guests here today. We've got Pork Ryan, our uh, breed association manager, and John Jackson from Stag Vets and Comfort Farms. We're so glad you're here. Welcome, welcome. Thank John, you. John, do you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Okay, awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. So my name is John Jackson. I'm the executive director of Stag Vets Inc. and uh, the founder of Comfort Farms. Comfort Farms is our um, it's a uh, it's a veterans program that's geared towards helping vet veterans who are experiencing crisis in their life um, to kind of you know let the farm and agriculture kind of absorb those issues. And we have a very unique approach which uh, we're developing, which is called agro um, cognitive behavioral therapy. And uh, the main thing is uh, with that, it's the conditioning effect of what agriculture can have on people to get their lives better. We're using it with veterans, uh, but anybody who's experiencing trauma can benefit from this. Um, the, the, what we kind of uh, preach and teach is that, you know, when people come here, they think they're here learning to farm, but uh, farming without throughout our whole cultures uh all the ancient most ancient civilizations up till now uh farming has also been a, a conduit and a bridge to just dealing with life and so uh we kind of talk about the overt curriculum that's within uh the farm lessons so when people come here you know i kind of listen to the stories and things like that and try to help them uh, within the farming aspect to deal with the issues that they have uh, going on. I can answer questions about that later, but but um, but mainly um, through the through the use of our uh, animals, which are all you know heritage breeds, and then we do some heritage crosses to create our own breeds for today, along with our vegetables. Everything has a story, and we want to show that veterans that even though um, sometimes they feel expendable going to war and many don't come back that their story does matter and we show that through the use of uh heirloom uh animals heritage animals and plants on the farm oh John! Ah! <laughs> all right um guys so you know if you're listening to marketing monday uh i'm extraordinarily passionate about marketing of heritage breed livestock guys today we we have uh, an actual dear friend to me this man, oh, let me make sure I don't uh, start crying or anything or choking up. Um, seriously, seriously, John Jackson is is a brother to me. Uh, this man has done a lot for me. He's one of my biggest mentors. And so I'm really grateful that I actually was able to get him on this live stream because y'all, he's busy. He, he is so <laughs> busy, he, so busy. I remember one time I invited him uh, to speak at a conference and he was so busy that it entirely that he was like, dude, can you tell me where to go and where I'm gonna be sleeping and when I'm gonna gonna need to speak? Because he's just so busy. And y'all, every time he talks, every every talk that I've been with him, every talk that I've invited him to, every every event that I've gotten to see him at, this man is just marvelous. Like I, I know I'm singing his praises and you know, hyping them up a little bit. But y'all, I, I definitely want y'all to just dive in with us today as we are going to be gleaning so much wisdom from John Jackson. He is a personal friend of mine, already vetted. I, I, he's the real deal. You ain't got to worry about him misinforming you about anything. All right, all right. So with that being said, um, you know, I love you, brother. Uh, with that being said, you know, you talked about, about, how everything has a story, right? And I think one of the things about um, heritage breeds is there's a lot of background, there's a lot of historical content um, for these breeds that oftentimes are not even articulated by breeders and farmers who raise these breeds. So in the context of like rabbits and what you're doing with rabbits, uh, talk about how storytelling is important for your farming operation and being able to, um, uh, acquire clients uh, to be able to engage audience members, especially those who are visiting the farm. Tell us the impact of storytelling, especially with rabbits. Yeah, man. So, um, you know, when, when you're a small farmer, right, you have to separate yourself from 
large agricultural giants. They can produce mm-hmm. you, they can produce it cheaply, they can produce it efficiently, and they're always going to beat you on price, hands down. So as a, as a as a small farmer that's trying to get into this uh, niche market and and actually connect with the people in your region, you have to develop products that make sense and um, and and or and like I try to tell people that the best markets are the ones that don't exist. And so when you can create a demand for mm-hmm. product that and, and, and share with people something that they didn't know that they need, it's a win-win. Um, the number one reason for why I gravitated towards rabbits and specifically heritage rabbits like our um, American chinchilla and the giant chinchilla and some of the giant Flemish and things like that is because a lot of these breeds, um, especially the American chinchilla and the giant chinchilla are threatened and endangered, right? And so the reason being is because like with a lot of animals, we developed a more um, we developed a more uh, regionally accepted and more economically accepted animal like the New Zealand that can breed and continue to breed and continue to breed. And throughout our history, we've done that. We've got rid of all these breeds, all these breeds that had culture tied into them and went towards more manufacturing breeds. Mm-hmm. And so manufacturing, we lose our culture, we lose our identity. And so when I bring back, you know, um, the, uh, the American chinchilla and I'm raising that, 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 that particular breed or if I'm crossing breeds and telling people that, hey, I use American chinchilla in this breed and things like that, we start going back to what's an American chinchilla? Well, and, and, and we'll tell people the story of, you know, uh, Dr. Stahl or David Stahl, who actually developed this breed. Um, it was actually called like the million dollar bunny. I mean, think about in the early 1900s, this guy made a million dollars off of this breed. That is significant. I mean, no one even thought about making a million dollars early in 1900s, but making a million dollars off of one particular breed of, of rabbit was really, really significant. I had the honor to share that breed in that loin that we uh, cut um, with Andrew Zimmerman on our, on the Bizarre Food show yep. that we did. And He's um, famous, y'all. Just FYI, <laughs> he's famous. We'll talk about that later. Go ahead. So, but the most important thing that when Andrew and I, when we butchered that rabbit for him and we cut it and we opened it and we looked at the loins, one of the things that the American chinchilla has is this really long, beautiful loin, right? And so when you think about that aspect, those are the attributes that we want to keep, right? We want to keep those in, in our rabbits, right? And the American chinchilla was bred obviously for its chinchilla-like fur, but as a meat rabbit, it was dual purpose and it had this amazing loins. And so what we've what we've strived to do is in order to keep it alive, I have a thing um, that I call, I say, hey, we practice conservation through consumption. Because here's the thing, if you cannot eat it, if you cannot partake of it, if you can't share the stories of how those things kind of, kind of uh, come to pass, then you lose it. You can't conserve it. And so mm-hmm. by, by conserving our animals that, that, that we love and we admire and that we bring to the center of the table, the biggest thing is we start creating demand for those things. And then, um, and, and almost essentially um, kind of like immortality for those animals, right? So that way they never die. And if they don't die, the stories of our ancestors and how they come along won't die as well. So that's why we, we gravitate towards heritage animals versus, um, our manufacturing animals. Oh, yes! God, dude, every time this guy talks, like I'm just always geeked and excited. <laughs> if y'all if y'all weren't listening, this man is a is a nerd. Um, <laughs> but he's a nerd of many things. Um, and you you can talk to him about just about anything, especially when it comes to agriculture. But one thing I, I, I love, and I'm glad that you brought this up, is loss of culture. Um, so when I go overseas to East Africa, usually I go about once a year. Um, there's this issue, not just with livestock, but even with crops, where it's hard to find some of the native crops. It's hard to find some of the native local livestock because they've been deemed as imperfect, um, 
unimproved. You need to get an improved breed, you know, st stuff like that. And what people, especially in those cultures and contexts, they don't realize they're like, oh, well, this is, this is what the Americans are doing. This is what the Europeans are doing. We want to go towards what they're doing. Not realizing that over time, they are losing more of their history, more of their culture by embracing things that we are doing. And so I think it's really important that, you know, not that we can't embrace modernization, not that we can't embrace um, efficiency of scale, uh, but being able to still have conservation efforts with the livestock that we have is super, super important because they are a historical link to the past. And I think that's really important for a lot of people to hone in on when they think about storytelling, being able to say, hey, you know what? Your great, your great, great grandfather was probably raising this pig, you know, <laughs> uh, you know? And, and, and not just the story of the pig, but the story of the people behind it. There are a lot of indigenous, a lot of African, a lot of uh, Europeans who really helped get this breed or these particular breeds where they are today. And they're part of also American culture as well. And so conservation, especially with livestock, because we can't, we can't freeze livestock. We can freeze the eggs, semen, you know, germplasm, uh, all that stuff. But the best way of conservation for livestock is by utilization, is by keeping them alive. They're not plants where you can just save seeds for a thousand years, you know, in that, that vault over in Europe, you know, but it's livestock who are able to have utilization in the long term um, is really important. So John, you know, I, I know so much about you, so I'm trying to make sure I, I give people some context. Uh, you, one thing I love about you, you have this cooperative spirit. And that's one thing that I teach people about is, you know, if you're a small scale farmer, especially a small scale farmer, you have to have a cooperative spirit. Um, kind, of, kind of walk people through what it looks like to have a cooperative uh, a spirit, not just with rabbits, but also with all the other livestock that you're having. How are you engaging other farmers, veterans, um, who are actually participating in your operation, as well as allowing them to have their own sense of uh, agency, their own sense of ownership? Yeah. So one of the things, uh, Ryan, when we actually start going back and we start looking at what I call our personal footprint, right? Our personal footprint is where we stand on our ground that we're stewards of and what we can do. And I ask everybody to look at their own low hanging fruit, right? Mm -hmm. My low hanging fruit in my region may be very different from someone who lives, you know, 20, 30 miles away from me. They might have something, com some resources that are completely um, you know, uh, resourceful to them that's not resourceful to me. And so what you want to gravitate for are the things that are really, really easy to do where you can create these markets and be able to, number one, pay the bills, right? So mm -hmm. being able to pay the bills, your, you know, uh, your feed costs, your electric, your, all your utilities, your, your rent or lease, whatever that is, those are the things that your operation must be able to do. And so what I like to do is um, I'm in a network or co-op of uh, folks. I, I keep no more. Uh -oh. Oh. Hey, hey, John, could you repeat that one more time? You uh, glitched out for a second. I'm sorry. Somebody's trying to call me. Um, so uh, I... I don't keep more than 120 hogs on my farm, you know, annually, right? So we're we're moving through because one of the things that I'm doing is I, I gravitated towards the American mule foot. And the American mule foot, uh, which is in the live, con live uh, conservancy breed, um, you know, is a specific hog for, that I that I totally believe in for many, many reasons. But one of the reasons why I'm trying to keep genetic pure stock of the American mule foot is so that I can create I can create other um, I can create different breeds out of the American mule foot. And the reason why I say that is the American mule foot has a very, very small gene pool. Right. They came out of 15.
you know, Doc Holloway's farm, 15 survived. And out of those 15, we have about 2,000 in existence. Out of those 2,000, we only have 600 registered. All of came from 15. So what we're looking at is a huge, strong bottleneck for this species. And as much as I love the American mulefoot, I already know that you can't continue to breed brother and sister to each other for the longevity of the breed. And so where I come is I'm looking at it's important for me to maintain genetic stock, but like every heritage animal of their time, they were created and crossed for a specific region or specific reason to uh, amplify uh, whatever that whatever was needed at that time. And so what I'm doing right now, um, when we actually do talk about, I do believe in the modifications of breeds and the modification of, 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 of vegetables, but I believe in that natural process. I don't believe in a synthetic process that, um, that a lot of our scientists want to do. They want to take the credit. They find the natural ways how things come. They go ahead, they synthesize it in the lab. Then they bring it back and say, hey, this is what we've created and this is what we've done. I don't believe in that. I believe in a natural process of being able to, like our ancestors and indigenous folks did, be able to be very observant, be able to pull the qualities that you need from those type of things, and also uh, put them in a way where they're going to be extremely uh, advantageous for um, for our region and our in our, uh, in our in our communities. Um, what I do is with my breeds that I'm creating, along with that. I partner out with uh, with other farmers in my region where we have about approximately 1,000 hogs in our network. So 1,000 hogs. Wow. One more time, John. Just one more yeah. time. Say it one more time. We have about 1,000 hogs within our network. So what I allow, what I... The, uh, what I have the farmers do is I have the farmers work on what we call our farm cross. And these are good old farm crosses that you'll have from families back 50, 60 years ago who maintained their lines of, of pure Berkshire, um, of, of Hampshire crosses, Gloucester spot crosses. And these are these didn't come from any type of um what do you call that stuff, man? Uh, show ring quality, right? So, you know, oh, heck no, nah. yeah, heck no, nah. forget those folks. These, the, there are no show ring quality hogs that came into the meat lines. So, you, so what you have is you have a dominant traits of old heritage hogs mixed into what this region provides pretty much almost kind of like what um, Japanese do in different provinces where there's not no such thing as this is the best hog or this is the best hog. They're all great hogs. They're all treated. Um, they're all treated wonderfully and they all have their unique aspects. And so what I do is take the ones that most uh, fit with how I grow, who my customers are, and we are curtailing and boutiquing a specific hog to take the traits of the American mule foot, make those breeds better, and also take the traits of what the American mule foot couldn't do, like have a, you know, American mule foots have very small loins, super tasty, but they're small, small. But with these breeds, what we're able to do is cross them back in, get larger loins. And what the American mule foot is able to do is throw that beautiful red meat and marbling in there that almost like you that you can't find anywhere else. And so my hope is that just like these animals and um, these animals that have been raised for hundreds and thousands of years through antiquity that have made it to this point, I too hope that the breeds that I'm definitely, you know, creating and, and, and molding from these breeds can last for the same amount of time in the future. Um, however, the one thing that I would do is not take away from the breeds that I've, that I've used and say, hey, this is it. I'm going to respect the breeds that I've used and pay homage to those ancestors prior to me who created those breeds so that way we can carry on those lineages. Wow, guys, John Jackson, everybody. Um, I love how he, he made a rabbit chat into a swine chat. Just <laughs> FYI, I was like, dude, because guys, he, he's a hot person at heart. This is how I know him. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you for doing that, John. I, anytime I get to talk about pigs, I love it. Uh, <clears throat> but you did mention something really important and it is uh, somewhat controversial in, in heritage breeds. It's talking about, uh, you know, crossbreeding, talking about uh, extinction vortex. 
um, which is where you get to a point where that bottleneck is so thin that you really have to start making some hard decisions on what to do. Uh, we have a lot, we have some breeds, not a lot, but we do have some breeds that they need a lot of assistance, even with birthing, even after birth. Um, it, it's hard. It's really hard. And we're doing the best to keep them alive. Uh, but you have kind of this future mindset of, and we talked about this earlier of, you know, some things, they, they, they had a good run. <laughs> and, and sometimes it's, it's thinking about what do we do next? One thing that we do encourage if, if a breed does get to that point um, is a grade up program. Uh, where you're finding genetically similar uh, livestock, in this case, it gets for rabbits, uh, genetically similar rabbits um, or any livestock, uh, and breeding up to that to kind of not just get some hybrid vigor, but just to keep the breed alive, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak, keep those genetics alive. Because genetic diversity is so, so important. We got some, like, yeah, we got some diseases and viruses for livestock that, I mean, once it comes on your farm, you're done. Yeah. Um, you know, things like African swine fever, uh, you know, which when they go to Africa, I have to be very careful about not bringing that over to the States. Um, it's something that's ravished China um, and they're still recovering from that. You know, we got a, a couple of rabbit, no, there's that virus that's out now. Again, guys, I'm not a rabbit person, but there's that virus that's mainly affects, uh, affecting the West Coast right now um with i think some cases on the east coast but mostly a west coast uh effect and so we got to have more genetic diversity because that will allow for there to be more conservation uh for the whole species even i'd say you know one of the things of us keeping these breeds alive through conservation so that way if anything happens on an industrial level we can always go back to viable long animals that have longevity animals that are not uh have weak immune systems and stuff like that so i think it really is important to not just think about you know what do we do in the meantime but also think about what do we do for the future of those genetics because those genetics are really important um so Brian, real oh, good yeah i'm yeah. gonna add on to that so one of the things that um when i started my um when I started, you know, working with uh, heritage animals like with rabbits and with pigs and with chickens and things like that, one of the things that I uh, brought to the table um, that I know a lot of most farmers don't is um, I have a, a research background. So preclinical research, uh, ne necropsy specifically, reproductive toxicology and pathology specifically as well. But one of the things that um, I do is a kind of like a hard call in stages right because when we think about what type of animals are we breeding most people are just looking at those strong phenotypes you know like you know hair color you know ear size and they're looking at you know um they're looking at saddle length and all these type of things right um but but we need to go deeper because at the end of the day what if the lungs on the lobes are not as strong or big as you know like you know um uh, other rabbits that we're breeding what if the liver lobes um if if all of them throughout the you know uh throughout generations have like cysts and nodules and things like that so what i do is i go down and when we actually do kind of like a hard call we i actually do a necropsy at stages between you know um between you know pups or kits um you know piglets all the way up to you know three month old all the way up to six, nine, and 12 months old, just to kind of see a representative of where they are in relationship to, um, to just health, right? Because our animals, one of the things that they do is they experience um, all of the natural, you know, stressors of the land, um, which I like to refer like the wine people, that's the tawar of the land, right? So the natural stressors of your land is going to actually create a unique, um, unique diversity within your within your herd, within your flock, your pods, whatever you have. Those natural stressors are going to create something very unique to your farm, because in other places across the country, animals don't have to 
to deal with those type of things. Um, we did find out that our rabbits, um, I, I, and one of the reasons why I just don't bring rabbits into our, into our herd is because of the fact that um, my rabbits stay outside. They have to be hardy. We know that all of our older uh, heritage breeds, they were hardy rabbits. They, they, were, they were farmed by um, old homesteaders and people that needed them for meat, and so they grew them outside. Um, and one of the things that you are looking at when you're raising rabbits like that is um, the most important thing is their ability to withstand the heat. And so Georgia is extremely humid. It is extremely a temperate environment where humidity is high, the heat is high. If you bring a rabbit from Michigan down here, it will not survive. But one of the things that we found out early on in our in our um, uh, in our discovery was that it wasn't that after our rabbits could could withstand the heat. One of the other things was withstanding the cold. Now, because they have fur, that's perfectly fine. They'll put on a fur coat easy. But we would lose about 50 to 75 rabbits in the early years of this whole thing when our, sum, when our winters all of a sudden turn into summer temperatures because mm-hmm. of the fact that, you know, it might be cold for a period of a couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden you get three or four days of those temperatures creeping up into the 70s and 80s. It's not unlikely. Well, guess who suffered? Those rabbits who had their winter coats on and then all of a sudden they needed to breathe and now they can't breathe because of the fact that, or they can't perspire as what they, to stay cool because they had their winter coats on, they died. A few survived. Those few now make up the large part of our, um, of our herd where they can survive both winters that, that result in um, heat during those times and throughout the summer. And so when people come and they ask me, hey, I wanna buy a rabbit, I say, yeah, we sell them for 150 bucks each. And they're like, a rabbit, 150 bucks each? Yeah, you don't have to pay for it. But in order to get to this point in this region, that's what they're going to cost because they have, I've spent the past 12 years on developing these rabbits to have this type of identical mark. And you're probably going to spend way more in rabbits that have died in order to get to where we are for 150 bucks. So I don't want to sell my rabbits anyway. So that's just one of those things. If you are going to buy it. <laughs> Amen. Uh, John Jackson, everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, I love your comment about Georgia. I know. Uh, it, it, see, every time I go to your farm in, in Georgia, it's always cold. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, actually, I'm kind of glad sometimes because, you know, the thing about Georgia and any, any further south is, uh, you know, Georgia, you don't really sweat in Georgia. Georgia sweats on you. There's a distinct <laughs> difference in sweat. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, I, I love at the end, you talked about how you would you would charge a hundred some dollars for um, a breeding rabbit. And I, I think you really bring on a really important conversation about valuing your time and not being afraid that's key. That's the key. Not being afraid to stand up to your prices. Now, you know, is there some wiggle room? Sure. If you if you can't afford some wiggle room, okay. But you know, but for the most part, a lot of farmers that I come in contact with, they have this this kind of insecurity about, well, you know, I I, I don't I, you know, I don't I don't pay for I don't pay for my own time. No, I, I do this because I love doing it. Sometimes I just want to say to those people like. Are you serious? Okay, if you're a hobby farmer, perfectly fine. I get you. I get you. I got you. I got you. You know, but if you're you're legitimately saying you are a, a for-profit farm, that you consider your farm as a business, I have to question whether or not people have a good understanding about valuing time and how your time is a commodity. So many farmers are are doing so many different endeavors that don't even work out. But if they would value their time, put their time, record their time, record how much time they're spending doing something, how much time and energy, money that they're putting into an enterprise and say, okay, we're going to, is this going to work? You know, this ain't working. We will will have to to cut this or we're going to have to make some changes, uh, whether that's pricing, whether that's 
uh, finding cheaper alternatives for feed, uh, whatever that might be. And so, you know, John, I, I kind of segueing in and then we'll go into a Q and A with the audience. You know, talk about the numbers. This is something that, this is something that, you know, I, 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 will, I, will, I will die, you know, I will die on the hill. This is something that I want people to understand. Talk about the numbers for raising rabbits for market, because that's so important. Mm -hmm. And, and be as transparent and as bold as you need to be. People need to just have, have a real conversation. They need someone who's not gonna sugarcoat or feed them a dream. We don't need that. We need some, we need numbers. We need, the, uh, we need people to be able to understand, you know, what does it look like to have record keeping for the rabbits? So again, real quick, you know, what are the numbers for you? Uh, you don't have to give specific numbers, but, you know, give, you know, ballpark numbers. And you know how are you record keeping with your rabbits? What's working for you, John? Yeah. So um, the number one thing is, like I said, it's it, the, the best markets are the one that are the ones that don't exist, right? And so we do know that people are gravitating towards uh, much more better, cleaner products. There is a there's a hard pull towards. Um, making uh, a segue into poultry because most poultry are are come from you know the cornish crosses which you know are, are kind of like the tilapia of you know they're they're, they're just like raising tilapia you know they're going to grow they're going to grow in a confinement and yeah if you feed it grass you can call it call it organic but it's the, still the same same animal right and so people are looking for options and so at the end of the day, when you start looking at rabbit and you start looking at, you know, uh, being able to um, help people understand that you can, um, you know, there are there are um, I don't want to say better products, but there are other choices. Right. Than poultry. Uh, you can you can literally uh, create a footprint within that segment. And so for me, when I started with rabbit, I started off with uh, just you know, um, at the farmer's market doing what I needed to do to sell rabbits. And I was selling about, you know, we, we were selling a couple of rabbits, um, uh, I would say a month, you know, not, nothing serious, probably about anywhere between 20 to 20 to 30 rabbits a month. Um, but then I got this, serious. I got, yeah, I mean, I, I got this, uh, you know, I, I kind of thought about something for a minute and I, and I went out to my restaurants and I started thinking about my restaurants and my chefs are, as individual people trying to um, compete with others within their scope, right? So at the end of the day, what I wanted to offer these restaurants were um, something that they can have the edge on their competition, right? And what who I sought out was I sought out restaurants who had some sort of like culinary French kind of, you know, background. And yeah. So yeah. when I went there, um, I, I specifically remember going to one restaurant and um, my, my sales guy at the time was trying to push uh, pork. And I'm looking at this guy, this is a James Beard award winning restaurant. It, I, you know, usually when you get to that level, it's you're kind of settled in on what you want to do and how you're going to do it every, you know, every week. And um, I kind of I, I could tell that the Sioux and the executive chef weren't really interested in doing pork because they already had, you know, a, a pork program. And so while my guy to do those sales, I took the menu and I started looking back on his menu and realized that his his menu was very, very French. And I said to him, I looked over and kind of interrupted my sales guy and I said, hey. I said, I see you have a French menu. Um, are you calling, you know, are you trained in France? And when I, he says, yes, you know, I was over in France and I learned. I said, did you work with Rabbit while you're over there? And he said, yes. And his eyes got big and we were talking. I was like, wow, that's so cool. But I'm so disappointed that you don't even have Rabbit on your menu. And he goes, oh, <laughs> you got him. Got him. <laughs> he looked at me. He said, you serve you 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 sell you carry rabbit and i said yeah and he goes wow when when can i get some i would love to have rabbit i haven't worked with rabbit and i said oh man we can do that how how much you want and he goes well i could do um he he says uh 
I, I need to do 80 a week. I'm like, what do you mean 80 a week? Like 80 rabbits a week? And he's like, yeah, I, I need 80 rabbits a week. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, so first of all, I don't know if I can do 80 rabbits a week, but I can work there if you're willing to, you know, I can give you what I can. I said, I can probably um, sk- kind of scale up in the next month or two to about like, you know, about 40 and 50. And then I can get some other veterans and then we can grow and things like that and other people and we can grow and then we can get up to 80. And he said, absolutely. I'll take whatever you whatever you got. So. Um, I say this story to say that, you know, pre COVID, we end up, we, we were end up selling 80 rabbits a week to, um, to restaurants and not just one restaurant. It was 80 rabbits that were going out. I, I can't, I can't physically even conceive of what 80 rabbits look like per week, right? Every, all that kind of stuff. But what I did know was that I had a demand for rabbits. I went out and I sought the um i sought the help of other farmers who needed who wanted to grow in this spot i found out that the perfect price for my rabbits on retail was eight dollars and fifty cents per pound so looking at three about you know most rabbits coming out of the marketplace today are about two and a quarter two and a half pounds we were doing about three pound rabbits three to 3.5 pound rabbits because of the giant Flemish and the, or the, the giant chinchilla and some of the Flemish. And this was within a 16 week period that we were getting these, these rabbits. Um, I consulted with my other farmers to make sure that they threw in, you know, the American chinchilla and, you know, we gave some breeding stock away. So that way those things can happen and, and develop, you know, um, naturally, but we were producing, um, uh, we were producing, between three and th- three point five, three and a half pound rabbits, and for my wholesale price, what I did for wholesale was I charged our client seven dollars and fifty cents a pound for a case, and a case was four rabbits, and that was catch weight, just like poultry. So catch weight is what, however many rabbits are in that box. That's the weight that you're going to pay for seven fifty a pound. It's easier than just kind of saying that, hey, each rabbit is going to weigh two two pounds or three pounds or whatever, because they all vary. And we just took the four that would that would go in the case. We would we would weigh them seven fifty a pound. That's it. Now, in order to keep up, I had to tell my uh, my farmers who were working with me, I had to give them a fair and reasonable price on rabbits. So I developed the market at 750 a pound for for rabbits and my farmers that worked for me and raised rabbits for me, they grew those rabbits and I would pick those rabbits up in lots of 25 to 50 at a time, which was pretty much every week would go out and pick 25 to 50 rabbits up at a time from each one of them and I would buy their whole slot and I would give them 550 a pound. And so 550 a pound for their rabbits, that's how much they were making. And they thought, and everyone agreed that that was more than fair for what you would get on even the commercial market. Because, I mean, you know, I had a friend tell me today that they're selling on a commercial market rabbits at 11 and $13 each, you know? So it's like, how can you compete with that? And so I'm giving my wholesalers I'm giving them five fifty a pound, where they're pretty much making, you know, between like seventeen dollars per rabbit. And so, at the end of the day, because I have a very diverse, um, you know, uh, food system that is connected intrinsically with small niche farmers, they're able to pull stuff from me that I couldn't sell. I'm able to pull stuff from them that they can sell. And together we have our own markets, but we all work together just like the major big players do, you know, and it's really important that each of each small farmers realize that we're not in competition with one another. We're here to help one another. And if my markets, if my markets are, if, if you're, if you're a person like, you know, Hey, if you're selling mushrooms and that's what you do and you have your own markets, but you have excess, well, guess what? My market needs mushrooms. I want to, I want my market to be so, so robust that I'm giving you trouble keeping up with your markets because I'm going to buy from you. And so I want people to be able to, um, to create their own markets, but also to help other people with their markets 
and that's how all this stuff works. So if you if you do 80 rabbits a week at uh, at 750 a pound, you know, at you know, let's say standard price at three at three pounds per, you're looking at 22, 20, yeah, let's say $22 per rabbit, 80 a week. And um, that's what you get for where we're at in our rabbit thing. And uh, and now I'm because of COVID, everything has gotten uh, more closely in line. We're selling rabbits um, in our CSA box and then we're pushing pushing rabbits um, for people that want exotic foods. Um, there's a special portion of that in our meat program that they actually get. Uh, we call it the wild game thing, you know, that they actually get a uh, rabbit within there because they want to eat. They want to eat uh, a little bit more of, of exotic meats. And now I have restaurants um, that want more rabbit. So we're, we're about to scale rabbit back up here this year for our restaurants that have come back online. John Gatson, everybody. Oh, man. I, I, you know what? I, I'm going to go home. I think I'm. I think we're done today. You, you just, I'm just kidding. Okay, so just to unpack some of this stuff, I love how you keep talking about how the best markets, the best opportunities, are the markets that don't even exist. You know, I have people who uh, who will complain. They'll, they'll contact me for consulting, and they'll like, well, hey, Ryan, you know, like I'm trying to, you know, like like sell pork and get get in the market. So I'm like, okay, you know, like. What's your market saturation look like? And they're like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like, I have to like take them down this this road of like, okay, like how many other pig farmers are in your local area? How many of them are selling at restaurants? How many or many of them are selling at farmers markets? Whichever market you want to feed into, how many other people are raising pork? Um, the way that you were raising pork, or maybe not the exact way, but like alternatively speaking, you know, and then uh, well, someone was like, well, there are already three pork vendors at the farmer's market and the farmer's market won't even allow me to sell pork because there are already three other vendors, right? And we, me, me I know you had some falling out with your market. We're going to talk about that later, um, you know, but, uh, you know, and so that's kind of like, okay, well then sell something different. And they're like, but I, I want to sell pork. I'm not saying you can't sell pork, but what do these farmers not have? You yeah. can't sit here and tell me that these farmers are all raising pork, lamb, beef, chicken, turkey, uh, rabbit, you know, quail, whatever it might be. You can't tell me they're doing every single thing. So find the thing that they are not doing, excel in that, and that will be the gateway to getting them pork, getting them selling them sauce. Get your sausage game. You know, and so I think rabbits are a really interesting way of, 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 of introducing someone to something very unique, but also can complement all the other products a farmer already has. Oh, yes. um, you know, so then going on to you talking about, again, one of the reasons why I love you, you have a cooperative spirit. Y'all, he is not in it for the money. Don't get me wrong. He, he's in it. To make, he wants to make money. Yeah. He wants to be profitable. But his main mission, his main objective is giving people uh, a sense of connection and making sure that they feel valued and cared for. Yes. That's yes. something that uh, a lot of people, whether they're veterans or not, a lot of people really need that in their life, that their time is worth something, but also that they're cared for. Um, a lot of commercial industry, agribusiness, big ag, uh, does not really care for their farmers. They might do publicity stunts and, you know, oh, well, we kind of care. But in reality, the prices don't, don't say that they care. What, the, what they're giving the farmers back doesn't say that they actually care. You know, they're only caring the way that's economical and affordable for them, you mm -hmm. know, these agribusinesses. But the, what you have with your cooperative spirit um, is that you're actually saying, you know what, I care about you. So if I need to increase my prices to make sure that you can have a kind of a living wage for what you're doing, yes. make sure it's worth your time, I'm going to do it because it's going to go to the consumer anyway. Yeah. It, ain't, it ain't my money. It's the, the, the consumers, the, the chefs are the ones that are going to be paying for it. So all, I, all you, John, what you're doing, all you're doing is making sure that you can make the right connections with the people who are going to value the product the most. 
and being able to say like, hey, yeah, you you a French restaurant. Why, why, why don't you got rabbit? But see, here's the thing. A lot of people wouldn't even know that. Mm. Like, oh wait, French cuisine, there's rabbit in that? See, and this is where we start getting into doing your homework. Again, guys, John Jackson's a nerd, and this is what's made him successful partly, you know, on top of his collaborative spirit, is he is not afraid to do the research. Understanding like, okay, how is rabbit utilized, mm -hmm. right? How, what do I do with a rabbit? But not just that, but culturally, mm -hmm. how has rabbit been cooked? Mm -hmm. what, what cultures, what cuisine really appreciates rabbit? And then finding the restaurants and markets that actually work in tandem with what you're doing. So important. It's like the like goats. A lot of people are like, well, you know, you can't get get good goat prices. People aren't 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 you know buying goat. I'm like, okay, who have you been talking to? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you know, um, you know, we've been going to this predominantly Americanized farmers market. I'm like, okay, but what about some of these international markets? Mm -hmm. Are you okay selling goats live? Mm -hmm. Oh, if you sell goats live, you ain't got to worry about processing. <laughs> Look at that. You ain't got to worry, worry about having a trailer. These, uh, I, I, and you know, I got a lot of international friends. They will pick, they will pick up, they get a pickup truck, they'll get a minivan. Yep. They will take your animal and you ain't got to see them again. They put it out. <laughs> Go ahead. What'd you say? I said they'll put it in the Kia. I've seen it. Yeah, see, you know, and so it's about understanding like, okay, every animal has a his, every species has a history, a culture, and a cultural experience, but you got to find the people who are going to appreciate it the most, right? And think outside of conventional means of the only way I can make money as a farmer is selling at a farmer's market. Heck no. We got to get rid of this notion that this is the only way that you can be profitable. You know, it's not just restaurant sales either, but it's about having diversified income streams, even through one enterprise is so important and finding different people that can complement that. It's so, so important. Um, so, you know, I, I could just ask you some more questions, but I know we have an audience that's probably very eager to ask you some questions, John. So after them, I'm gonna ask you maybe a couple more and then we'll try to wrap it up. So uh, Brittany, back to you. We got any questions from the audience or any praises? Um, so far from John Jackson. Let's see. Yes. So we have Lisa. Hi, Lisa Marie. Thanks for joining us today. She's happy marketing Monday. And then our friend Chad says happy Monday. Thanks for joining us. Chad. Hey, buddy. I'm glad you're back. Uh, he, he was serving, or I think, Chad, I think he was serving in Afghanistan and, and a couple other places. He just came back. Nice. Um, so he'll be back for, hey, Chad, give me a call, dude. I called you, bro. Um, anyways, I uh, hope you're hope you're enjoying your rest time. We'll talk later. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, let's see. Lisa says, "Got to eat them to save them." That's true. Amen. Amen. Preach it. Some questions and some comments. Let me find some. Love all the praise. That is so wonderful. Let's see. Hi, Terry. Thanks for joining us today. Terry says, hi, John. Good to hear from you here, man. Do you find that any specific heritage breeds are better adapted or can be more easily bred to become better adapted to the high summer temps and humidity of the Southeast and others? Yeah. So <clears throat> great question. Great question, Terry. Um, <clears throat> let's go back to um, all of us peel the onions back into our indigenous ways, right? and um, how we would select for those type of things or taking things that already exhibit those type of qualities and breeding them in. So like if you want a more hardy rabbit in the Southeast, then you would come to someone like myself who are breeding for those qualities, right? And so you'll take those qualities that I'm breeding for and then that's where you set the foundation for your program. So anything that you wanna do, and this is the way indigenous people have done this throughout antiquity, they paid attention to what happened. You know, obviously if there was a strong kill off of certain animals or certain plants and the ones that survive, like if your tomatoes, so if you have a tomato that survives hard frost while all the other tomatoes died, do you kill that one or do you save that one? You save that Keep one. Keep them seeds, keep the seeds. Right? 
because for some reason, those seeds have the genetic uh, propensity to carry on through the frost. And the same thing, if you're having issues where you're, you have uh, rabbits or, or any type of animals that are not doing well within your region, climate change, th these heritage animals didn't live through our climate change that we're living through right now. But what these heritage animals do have are the genetics that staved off certain type of diseases, their particular type of climates that they had. And what we need to do as artists and stewards of this world is go, and, go ahead and construct animals for our time. We cannot wait until we all are looking like the damn Sahara Desert out here to finally figure out, hey, we need to go ahead and save animals and plants to meet our thing. We need to already be projecting in that area, right? And so, you know, um, one of the things that I do is purposefully, I send out breeding stock of certain things or seeds to certain parts of the country. They have those. People raise them. Guess what? They bring them back. Matter of fact, I'm going back up to South Carolina to pick up one of uh, one of our mule foots that um, that my buddy had raised for us, and he uh, had crossed them with some tamworths. They did really, really good. I'm bringing back a I'm bringing back a sow that has done really good back to my herd here, um, because it's been up in South Carolina. It's withstood certain things. It is uh, it has done extremely well. And so all we're doing is strengthening our genetics. Um, we collectively, us farmers. Uh, our network is stronger than Facebook. Our network is stronger than the interweb because we have our pulse on the food system. And not only that, we have our pulse on the living food system that will, um, that, that can succeed uh, for generations and generations. Uh, I hope people in the next five to 600 years are sitting back, looking back at the archives of what we're talking about today and, and the systems that we use today to make their world a better place. Uh, but it does start here with collectively what we're doing. And thanks for that question, Terry. Yes, thank you. Excellent Let's... question, excellent response. Um, hi, Kirk, thanks for joining us today. We're glad you're here. Kirk says, one thing to keep in mind is that with much effort, one can create strains within a pure breed that are like a breed within a breed. Each of these strains can be selected to better match the need of the particular farm without crossbreeding. Well, that's it. You know, Kirk, I appreciate, I appreciate that. But let's understand this, that what is a pure breed? Mm -hmm. pure, the only pure breed that we have is a Eurasian wild boar. And that's the only pure breed. And out of those domestications from over the centuries, in each of the breeds that we have today are indeed crosses, like dogs. They all have they all have their uh, um, they all have their purebred genetics. But let's be honest: those anything that we call the purebred is due to incest, and it's due and it's due to um, interbreeding within that particular um, line or lineage to create that pure bred animal for a specific purpose. It may have been Serrano style hams out in Italy or Spain. It may have been Kentucky or Virginia hams that we use out here, or maybe um, how we use fatback or how we use our lard for our We can't hear you, Jack. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, wait a second. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah. So any, preaching. any of any of these things that that come about are the result of people saying that, hey, you know what? I want a Duroc. They they called it a Duroc. That Duroc did not happen just on its own. That Duroc was the result of breeding over time, the ch just like the Chihuahua, just like the Doberman, just like the German short hair pointer. They're all collectively breeds that were brought in to serve a specific purpose and to say that we in our time should not have the ability to create things. Oh, we lost you again. Avio went, uh, there we go. Yeah, I, I just shut that off. I got people calling me, uh, my bad. So, but just like our times, we should be improving, as we say in the military, we should be improving our foxhole for the next generation. And that means taking the breeds that we have, 
making sure that they're viable, but also answering the call that many of my chefs have because I work closely with them that they want a specific type of animal. Um, mm -hmm. Many, many pork, pork that we have today, and this is my niche, I'll let you guys know about this. Pork that we have today is slow cooked to 200 degrees and it's an abomination to what pork is supposed to be. Yes, there I said it. So what do I do? I run towards what we as Americans don't do and that's create pork that what the rest of the world typically eat, which is a roasting hog, roasted to the to the perfect temperature of 145 internal temperature, where it's served medium rare, where that fat renders throughout that hog for however long, and the intramuscular fat infuses flavor. That's the pork that I raise. I cannot find that in pure breed hogs today, so therefore I have to create it. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, um, hard words, hard take it or leave it. He he just put that on the table, and uh, you can you can choose to take that or leave it. But let me tell you, there's some wisdom in what he said. Um, you know, I, I was actually doing some uh, research into red waddles. Again, I love pigs, um, and uh, doing some research because some people who are raising red waddles had reached out to me, and um, I was like, okay, yeah, I can check some historical information. Turns out, you know, some of the red waddle stock, original stock, um, you know, from one of the, the farmers who really helped bring the breed uh, back into uh, prominency, it had some Duroc influence in it. Mm. So it's kind of like, like, you're not going to get a what, quote unquote, 100% purebred animal. Um, I know that we do a lot of genetic testing, but um, genetic testing is not, that type of forensics is not 100% foolproof. It's not God. It, it's something that you can use on top of other tools to make a wise decision on breeding, but it's not the end all be all. And so John, I, I love how you talked about how, you know, it's really about looking at what, the, what, what do I need? What, what does my farm need? What do my clients need? And sticking to that, amen to the fact that medium rare pork. Oh, <laughs> that's how I eat my pork chops. Don't give me no full cooked pork. I'm sorry. I love you, fam, but you know, just not happening. I'm, guys, he's my brother. We think alike. Just FYI. Um, okay, on to the next question, Brittany. We're gonna do one more. Pick a really good one. Pick a really, really good one. Let's see. So, thanks for the discussion, Kirk. I think we've got one more question. Oh, uh, let's see. Lisa says, what would be a good rabbit that is cold hardy for Alaska and are easy to handle and good for beginners? So, um, Lisa, I haven't, I haven't been to um, Alaska, um, you know, personally, but I do understand that it's, uh, it, it's, it's as cold, if not, well, let's just say the, the marine winter training is done in, in in New York instead of Alaska for a reason, right? So it's 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 at least just as cold. So first thing I do is um, I would look at some historical data of homesteaders from over a hundred years ago, right? Those are going to be. A oh, is that me or no? That was me. That was me. Go ahead. Um, I would look at some of the historical data from like over 100 years of, of, of what some homesteaders have done, what they have traditionally done in that area. Um, what I also recommend is um, if you do get a if you do get rabbits, um, finding temperate rabbits that are that are, are cold weather. I, I think it's easier to find rabbits that could withstand the cold more than those that can withstand the heat. Right. Mm -hmm. So what what we're looking what you're going to look for, I would say, is not so much what rabbit can withstand the cold, but when are you going to bring that rabbit into Alaska so that way it can acclimate to the cold environment? Because you don't want to bring a rabbit to Alaska in the dead of winter. You don't want to bring the, the uh, uh, 
a, a rabbit to the um, to Alaska in the dead of summer. You want those transitional periods, kind of like the beginning of spring or so like that, where that rabbit can stay there and then it can adjust into its cycle naturally. So uh, because animals, especially heritage animals, more so than your lab raised animals, like your, your white New Zealands and things like that, your heritage animals are going to be closely linked more towards homesteading groups that or m homesteaders that have raised their rabbits outside. So in their lineage, there's going to be this propensity for those animals to to develop thicker coats and to the and to withstand um, the the temporal zones that they're in. So I, I can't give you an answer of like which one. I mean, I love the American chinchilla. I say go American chinchilla all the way. Um, and and I also say um, the giant chinchilla, which are beautiful, beautiful animals. But you also have you know animals like uh, like Rex, you know, uh, which have beautiful coats. Um, having a having long hair does not indicate whether it's um, whether it's going to be more more suitable for cold or not. Um, we are you know we're not we're not as long as we're not using you know naked rabbits from a lab you know like that look like naked mole rats then you're, you're probably going to be fine and and i would stick in this case i would stick more towards um a heritage rabbit versus your kind of standard rabbits at this point not saying that you can't bring in a new zealand later on to give more genetic diversity um but i would say go with um homesteaders who have similar clients to where you are in get the rabbits from there and then bring them up so that way they can acclimate to your area. And if I can add to, to what John had said, which sounds like, uh, I, I don't even know if I've, I've deserved to add anything onto what John said, uh, but if I could add one thing, uh, you know, Lisa, it might also be that you might be that person that has to do that work. And are you willing to answer that call? Now, for most people, they're like, nah, uh, I'd, I'd rather just buy something that's already working. Mm -hmm. But I will say, you know, if, again, there's a need, if you can't find anybody, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know if you can't find anybody, but if you can't find anybody, you might just be the answer to a problem people are having or didn't even know that they did have, mm -hmm. you know? And so, hey, market opportunity, hey, think about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that can be an opportunity for you and your family um, to not just, you know, make additional income, but also be more integrated and inspire others towards um, what you're doing towards a, a heritage breed livestock program or just livestock consumption. Um, so I would encourage you to just consider, I'm, I'm going to put it on the table, just gonna <laughs> leave it there and you can pick it up or not. Uh, but for anyone else that's listening, uh, that might be your your thing too, you know, do you have people in your area that can supply you good stock? If you don't, but you see that there is a need and people are asking for rabbits, you know, can you fill in that gap? Because if you fill in that gap, you have a stronghold on that market, yeah. you know? And then from there, kind of like what John's doing, you can build out with other farmers, contract and say, hey, you know, my market's booming. Like, <laughs> and I can't do everything. I can't do everything. But what I can do is contract you out, give you a fair price, and I'm just going to pass on that price to to the con to consumer, to the chef, whoever it might be. You know, so definitely consider that you don't have to do everything by yourself or for yourself, but that you can actually work with other people. All right, so uh, John, you know, oh, go ahead, go ahead, John. One more thing oh, I wanted yeah. to say um, earlier. You mentioned one of the things that I want everybody to understand too about this marketing thing is that you know sometimes we go to a chef and a chef may have pork or a chef may be may have rabbit or a chef may have a certain type of beef or a certain type of poultry right and we we tend to say you know in chefs because they're they they are the problem when it comes to this they they tend to say well i already have a pork purveyor i already have a rabbit purveyor i already have a poultry whatever you know, they get their place from the one farm and so my answer to that and what i tell chefs is you know especially when i look across their menu is that you don't have one bourbon you don't have one whiskey. You don't even have one water. So why do you have one type of meat product, right? But here's the thing. What you do is you're robbing your customer of- Hold on one second, John. Hey, Brittany, can you mute yourself? The background noise on your end is cutting off his sound a little bit. All right, go ahead, John. So one of the things that, that we have to understand is that um, 
that yes, you know, there are some good products, but you rob yourself of, you rob your customers of what the terroir and the creativity of other farmers are doing by only limiting yourself as a restaurant to just one product, only one pork purveyor, only one rabbit purveyor, only one, you know, um, one beef purveyor, right? Because we do know that there are different complexities, just like wine, that causes these stressors, the terroir of the land, that help our animals grow and make them unique. And if we start thinking like the Japanese, if we start researching like how Japanese actually do it, there isn't one best, they all are best. The challenge is for each restaurant to make them the best. And that really creates our soil food web system that we have and, and make it tight. Whereas the big guys really can't do it because they, they do everything in the manufacturing in the manufacturing world. But as small farmers, if we could all share that part of the ply with our restaurants, we, we do a better job at serving our communities in a more impactful way. So that's all I got to say on that. Yo, that's all he has to say. <laughs> John Jackson, everybody. All right, all right. A couple more questions and then we're over time. I, I have to milk this opportunity for all it's worth because you're a busy man and I love you. So I want to spend as much time as I possibly can with you. Um, so I want to ask you uh, at least one more question. So I've, I've been, John, John, just real quickly, tell them where you, where, where you live. Tell them where Comfort Farms is. Yeah, man. So uh, Comfort Farms is in the middle of Georgia in a town called Milledgeville, which used to be the capital of uh, Georgia um, when Sherman and his crew came and wrecked shop. And so uh, we're just a small town. And um, but now uh, we're getting a lot of exposure, you know, to the project that we have here in this uh, in this great place. So Milledgeville is like in the middle of nowhere, y'all. I've uh, been to his farm a couple of times and uh, they, they, they ain't nothing out there, y'all. There's barely anything out there. Um, you know, there's a there's a small college. That's about it. That's really about it. So, so a lot of people will say, you know, because, uh, you know, when you're buying land, sometimes you got to live further out to get cheaper land. And that might mean you're in a town that isn't hip or foodie or anything like that. And so I get a lot of excuses of, well, my local market won't support me. Uh, my local market doesn't care about my local market. Oh, I love this assumption. My local market won't buy my product mm. without even really talking to anybody. They, they won't buy my product. They don't want my product. You know, they're either too poor to have my product or they'd rather get stuff from Walmart. That's all they care about. You know, John, can, just, just really quickly <laughs> for me, can, can you break down how that, not that that's not a factor, but how that really doesn't matter, how that's not really as huge of a hurdle as people think it is. Talk, talk about your own experience. Yeah, so one of the first, uh, when I started here in 2016 in February, um, I did have, uh, there was a local market that I was gonna join, um, but I kind of, I, I personally kind of felt after coming out of war, you know, spending, uh, you know, I was with the 75th Range Regiment, spent um, 40 months overseas, six deployments, you know, my first eight years. I just didn't want to deal with a whole lot of people. And so uh, when I was talking to these folks about, you know, their market, I kind of see that they were very cliquish and and it, it almost kind of seemed like, you know, if I was going to be let into the club and it really forced me to say, hey, man, you know what? I don't want to be a part of your market. I'm going to create a market right here on my farm. And um, they kind of said, well, good luck, you know, you know, and, and, and kind of left. But the, the whole purpose of me uh, doing that was that I created a destination for people to come to. Families are want to travel, especially from the city environment to the country to go, you know, to farms and to have that experience. I, I, I invite chefs down to my farm. We have an open fire pit, uh, you know, kitchen outside where chefs are cooking and they're doing things. We prepare meals every Saturday. At our market, people come in and instead of, you know, picking, you know, vegetables, you know, that are already prepared and look pretty and tied up in a bow, they come in and they walk our gardens. They read the history of our heirloom plants and our heirloom and heritage animals. And they go ahead and they let us know what they want. We pick it fresh for them right there, you know. And so we give them an experience 
based on the form that you can't get in the supermarket that you really can't get in a in a farmer's market neither when people come through you know especially you know a lot of african americans and, and a lot of you know non african americans that come through you know i i can show them the corn that was responsible for um the southeast and in georgia that that was largely responsible for the nutrition of enslaved people there's that corn sea island white flint that's responsible for many african americans being alive today um people are in touch with that they can see it they can touch it they can smell it and the best thing that i did was open up my farm as a destination for agritourism that really have called in people from all over this country and out of this country i just did two articles one for germany um the german type uh, times and also another article for sweden which by the way i just found out in my lineage that i do have swedish and Germ germanic europe in me so <laughs> i need to discuss or discover more of those type of things as well but you connect with people at the place that matters most the farm um and teach them about their culture teach them about your culture and um and we learn together and it's it, it's it doesn't matter where you are as long as you are able to um as long as you're able you you're wanting to connect with people and uh and teach them uh the things that you yourself has learned have learned amen guys yeah. i can't express how important it is to connect with whoever your audience, your clientele are, because it, it's about creating an experience, not just saying, oh, well, I sell this heritage breed. Like some people, and no offense to people that do this, you know, but some people are literally just banking on just the word heritage alone. Yeah. Like, oh, well, I got heritage pork. I got heritage rabbits. So therefore you should buy my product. And really it's like, but, how are you adding value to people's lives? How are you engaging people's lives? And a lot of them, they're not. They're just banking on a on a label rather than rather than creating an experience. And so, John, I really appreciate your approach. And uh, so, for those of you who don't know, uh, John Jackson does this thing once a year during January called the Georgia Boucherie festival and let me tell y'all it is an experience for a lot I, I don't care what other things going on in the foodie world you need to make his boucherie a, a priority on your bucket list please please come on down he got some good food and it, 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 i'm just i'm like i'm so excited i'm just geeking out here so i'm gonna advertise this really quick um I remember when he first invited me to his very first boucherie, y'all. I actually got to uh, uh, dispatch a rabbit. That was, he was like, yeah, yeah, you know, can I have a volunteer? And, you know, he invited me and my mom. This is how much of a man this man is. He invited me and my mom down to this boucherie. And my mom got to see me dispatch a rabbit. Now, I've done that thousands of times before doing that, but he makes the boucherie engaging. So with the boucherie, it's about uh, engaging in the entire process of agriculture, whether it's crops or livestock. So you're going to see the animal live before you eat it. You don't have to engage in it. You can sit there and watch or you can participate. Uh, and so he gives plenty of opportunities for people to participate in, in the uh, killing, slaughter, and the butchering process, as well as the cooking process, which he has amazing people from literally around the country um who are you know doing their own style like one guy gets a ham another guy gets a pork belly and another guy gets you know, just all kinds of things and the food that they make y'all y'all <laughs> y'all this stuff it's amazing i mean you will not go hungry going to his boucherie you're just not all the food you're going to eat is Phenomenal, fantastic. But you know, the, the one thing I love the most about the butchery, it's not just the food, food's amazing. Not just see, not just the, 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 the butchery engaging process, it's the community. Mm -hmm. John has effectively engaged and established community at his butchery every single year. 
he doesn't just have veterans that are there. He has regular civilians. He has chefs, foodies. He's got anybody and everybody from just about any kind of background that goes there. I have learned so much about what it means to be uh, to be in the armed forces and to be a veteran and the hardships of that. I've also learned what's it, what's it like living life as a human being because I get to experience other people's experiences, whether they've served or not. I get to actually have fellowship, you know? And so guys, I, step up your game when it comes to engaging your audience. If you're not building fellowship with your audience, you're not, you're not really, that's the best marketing tool. You know, when we had Keisha Cameron on here uh, a couple of months back, you know, I told her the best marketing tool is good character, right? Well, with good character comes fellowship and community because that's what attracts people. People are not just attracted to John Jackson, not just attracted to the farm. They're attracted to the community that builds itself. And so if you can create that on your farm with your farm business, let me tell y'all, you, you literally have created a miracle. <laughs> You've created a, a, an experience that people will want and look forward to going back to year after year or week after week, sometimes a couple of days during the week, being able to bring people out and say, hey, you know what? Can I volunteer at your farm? You, you seem to got a lot going on and I wanna learn, I wanna help out. And creating space for people to also do that too is really, really important. So anyways, I know we're about running out of time. John, I got, I got, yeah, I love you, dude. I, I got one more question though. Um, so we, we've had, you know, some pretty um, hard conversations, but not conversations about hard topics. Um, you know, and so I know that uh, there are some people, especially African Americans who might, or indigenous people who are not white, who might feel insecure about marketing their product. Um, kind of, kind, what kind of, what kind of message, what kind of word can you give to people who feel some insecurity about their product um, because of what they look like or what they believe? Mm -hmm. um, kind of talk to people about that. Yeah, man. So um, the issue of heritage, the issue of isolating, being isolated, you know, uh, from your heritage or the things that you uh, gravitate towards um, is a huge thing, especially in the farmers uh, network. There are only one percent of us that are uh, farmers in the country. And and out of that one percent, um, five percent, you know, uh, you know, African or black farmers and, and non uh, non-white farmers make up 5% of the 1%, you know, so we're very, very small, small, uh, my minority of people within the farming realm. And so at the end of the day, even though farmers are a very small group, um, we still as black farmers, as Hispanic, Asian, whatever you want to call it, we, we still have to set ourselves different and apart from everything else. And one of the things that I gravitate towards and I tell people, and regardless of who you are, I don't care if you're white, if you're black, if you're Asian, Hispanic, I don't care who you are. Number one thing to do is to grow the food that speaks to your DNA. Okay. And the reason why I say that is because you are going to be the subject matter expert of your indigenous past. You need to feed and tell the stories of the ancestors that got you to this place, whether they are Norwegian or, you know, Scandinavian or African or in Native American uh, indigenous folks. There was a food item, a food system, an agricultural system that developed your culture. And if you as a person need to do the history, go back into your past and grow the foods of your ancestors they subsisted on those foods so you could be alive today. When we do that, what we do is create this atmosphere around us, a protective bubble around us that people want to be a part of. They want, I want to go. When I open up my book and I'm starting to read about Spanish cuisine and I have Spanish friends and I want to make something authentic for them, guess who I'm looking for? I'm going to the farmer's market or someplace I want the Spanish lady, Spanish man, who doesn't even speak English. Speak English. <laughs> I, I, that's who I'm going to. I'm finding a certain pepper. I'm talking to them about how they prepared certain things over live fire or whatever it is. I need to have those conversations with those people because they're the subject matter expert on their thing. And I tell black people, 
If you're not raising and growing watermelon, you're wrong. Watermelon is <laughs> Africa. It is from our country. It is where we subsisted. Okra, if bringing collard greens out of the Mediterranean, or um, even even um, even rice, which is not even spoken of as a as an African thing, is spoken as an Asian thing. But what we don't understand is that even rice was the reason why um, uh, enslaved Africans were bring were being brought out of Senegal and West Africa over to the Carolinas with their rice to create what we have, Carolina gold which has created a multi-million, even to the billion industries into the Southeastern culture foodways. That's our history. Knowing that, growing those foods, telling the stories of our ancestors mean that we are not degrading their, their time past. There's a lot of people that are non-black who are, are white folks, whose families were sharecroppers, which was another form of slavery that they could not get out of. What foods did they grow to success? Being able to tell those stories and connect with your past in a way is so empowering because you talk about those stories and you share food of those stories from a position of empowerment, not from a position of pity. And that mm. to me is the most important. So when you spend all your time out there on your ground and you go to your market and you have the foods from your culture and your past, you stand there proud, ready to talk. And the most important thing is that when people buy your food, they bring it to their table. Your stories last well long after the dinner is done. And that is the most important. We're not selling food, we're selling experiences. And you have to give your customer a wonderful experience for them to continue to come back, share those stories, and ensure that the foods that you're raising survive through uh, conservation through consumption because I, I totally believe that. Mm. Mm. <laughs> oh, John Jackson, everybody. Oh man, no more victim mentality, people. Yes, man. We, we gotta. We we we. No, no more. No more. As, as someone who's lived that uh, in multiple levels of my life, no more. Absolutely not. Because one thing I've learned from my own personal experience of, of living in that mentality is it, it stunted my growth and it made me feel like I wasn't good enough to move forward that, or that I needed to wait for someone else to help me move forward. Instead, you know what? I'm going to pick up my own. Let me not cuss. I'm going to pick up. <laughs> my own tools and my own God-given tools and do the work that I need to do. I can't, cannot live in a victim mentality. Um, and so it, it's so important, I think, um, and you really brought, brought this. I love the, um, in some of our previous conversations, you talked about one of your friends, I think who was Hispanic and he was growing just, you know, all kinds of like cute regular things that it's like, well, that's not really, it's not really like, why are you growing that? Do you even eat that? Well, no. That's another thing. Don't don't be raising something or growing something that you don't eat, that yeah. you don't even want to eat. Just that's just a no no. That's just don't do this for money. Yes. Do this because you want to create an experience. Do it because you want to connect to something deeper than just what you think is yourself. Deeper, something deep. And I think that's something that's really important for people, especially after all the shenanigans that's happened um, in 2020 um, is being able to, to connect to something that is more real than our own conscious understanding of reality, where we can go back to our ancestors. I know it's hard, especially because you, you know, before this conversation, we talked about genealogy and how you, you found out uh, some, of where, some of where your ancestry comes from. Um, it's hard thinking of like, well, there's, there's a lot of information, especially me as African American, there's a lot of information, but I even have a hard time finding specific information about going back past my great grandfather. Like there's still a lot that's kind of unknown about him. You know, we only got hints and clues as to where he came from and what his genetic makeup and culture was. But going further than that, we kind of hit some dead ends. And so if, you're someone that's experiencing that, no matter what your race is. Um, I just want to say, especially people who are adopted, you 
you might really not know where you come from um, in terms of uh, specific lineage, not just genetic gene pools. You know, understand that if you, if you can't find it, create it. Create something new for yourself. Mm. I think that's really important. Create, if you don't, if you can't find that tie, create something new that way your kids and your grandkids and your great, 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 great grandkids can say, you know what? My great, 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 great grandfather, grandmother, whoever, you know, did this. And I want to continue that legacy on today. You know, if you don't have a story that you can go back to, create that story today. And John, I think that's what you're doing today. You know, I know me and you have talked a lot um, and you've talked about the kind of legacy that you want to leave behind, especially yeah. with the pigs, the mule foot, you know, and you, you know, your KOKO -KO and um, your wool Jabali, you know, uh, your crosses that you want to have, that you're having, how you want to make sure that there's not just simply credit, like that, because you helped develop those breeds, but also you want to make sure that those breeds exist for the future, that those genetics are viable for the future. And I think for a lot of people, your legacy, honestly, for anybody, it's not just what you do today. Yeah. It's how what you do affects people tomorrow, how it affects families, not just your family, but other people's families tomorrow. So think about that while you're farming. What kind of legacy do you want to leave in this world? Not just in farming, but just in this world, period. What kind of legacy do you want to leave? And then add that to your mission statement. Mm -hmm. Add that to your, to, to your public because that will be a reminder. You can always go back to that and say, you know what? I've lost track. I, I've, I've been trying to do all this and do all that. I need to go back to what I said I was going to do in the first place. Mm -hmm. And making sure that what you do aligns with that. Some of y'all are farming and you're not really farming. And I want to make sure that y'all have an understanding that goals are good. It's good to have goals. And it's good to work towards those goals. Uh, but make sure that's more than just the goal itself, because you are more than just a goal. You're a human being. You're a person. You have history and experiences. Those things not only need to be cataloged, uh, but they also need to be shared. And so by being able to create experiences on your farm, people are able to, to learn more about you and the legacy that you want to leave behind. That can inspire new farmers. Mm -hmm. That can inspire policymakers, future policymakers, who end up thinking about the small farmer. Hmm, interesting. Or advocates who think about the small farmer. Or people might go into tech, but they're like, you know what? I want to work and figure out ways of, of making small farmers more successful through integrated technologies. Hey, you will interact with so many different people as a small farmer. But the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you're able to market your story to market the story of your livestock, in this case, rabbits, um, you know, to be able to market the story of your ancestry, of your lineage. But more importantly, this is wise words from someone who is really important in my life. Um, one thing that she told me was, you know, create story, create story. It's not, it's not, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And actually, you, you you passing the baton on somebody else in reality. So create that story if you don't have it already. And really see what kind of story do you even want to have. All right. I'm done. I know we've just been talking. And Brittany got to go back to doing stuff or just relaxing. Um, and, John, you got to get back to farming because you're so busy. But, John, uh, I just want to say I love you. I, I'm so glad you're here. Um, you know, but uh, I'll – I'll pass it back to Brittany, then we'll do some closings, and then we'll have John close a little bit, and then we'll do our spiels. Um, so go ahead, Brittany. All right, well, just wanna say thank you. Thank you to everybody for joining us today. Thank you, John, thank you, Ryan. This has been wonderful. Um, I'm gonna say thank you to all our members and supporters. Um, you make programs like this possible, so thank you, thank you, thank you. We couldn't do this without you. Um, Let's let's wrap let's wrap it up. I know everybody's busy today, and um, let's do our our um, shame, shameless plug section. I don't know how to follow that because it was, it was so wonderful and beautiful. And um, so, John, do you have anything that you would like to plug? 
Yeah, so um, we are, uh, I, I was able to get a grant from NIFA um, for the next three years, and we created um, a school here called Act Tech to Success. I partnered with Central Georgia Technical College and also um, Fort Valley University and uh, Georgia College. So anyone that's interested in regenerative farming practices um, in this, uh, the philosophies, theorems, and also as a business, uh, we are um, we have that class here, especially if you're uh, living in middle Georgia area to be able to attend. Um, if you are interested in an online portion, um, we're going to make those available, too. So that's a big deal right now, because at the end of the day, in order to um, to save our community, save our environments the way that we need to, we have to have more people that are willing to stand up and fight for what's right. And in this case, it's uh, definitely regenerative farming practices, which has a strong focus on heritage and heirloom livestock. That's wonderful. And can people find that on your website? Yeah, so you can go to Comfort Farms on Facebook or Instagram, and you can go to my Stag Vets. Um, you can go to my Stag Vets uh, website at www stagvetsinc.org. Uh, you'll find information there and always reach out to me. I'm on Comfort Farms or uh, Instagram. Uh, I post a lot there. So send me a message. Uh, if I don't get back to you right away, I will within the next 24 hours. And uh, any way that I can help, um, please reach out. Uh, Ryan is a great friend of mine and um, a, a wonderful resource. And um, my success is based on how successful you are. So um, I, I want to ensure that people um, get the success they need. Absolutely. Yes, please yeah. reach out to, to John. Go to his website and find him on social media. Awesome. Well, folks, um, if you've enjoyed any of this, any, any of this, and <laughs> We hope, hope you did. You <laughs> we hope you did. I mean, I, I brought, I, I only bring the best. So, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> you gotta have, but if you've enjoyed any of this content, uh, feel free and we encourage you guys become a member of the Livestock Conservancy. We do do um, uh, like an annual $45 membership or, or you can be like me, a conservation champion, which sounds fancy, really does. Um, you know, but basically I pay $4, $4 a month um, to be a member of the Livestock Conservancy. That's just, you know, directly out of my account. I ain't got to worry about renewing my membership once a year because I know some of y'all jokers, y'all are like, oh, well, I, 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 I thought I renewed. Like, you think I'm not a member? Well, how'd that happen? Oh, I forgot. Oh, I'm so sorry. You ain't got to worry about that if you're a conservation champion. I don't even have to worry about that because I'm a conservation champion. Uh, so, again, cheaper than a cup of Starbucks coffee, cheaper than a pack of cigarettes. You know, um, definitely, definitely consider becoming a conservation champion for the Livestock Conservancy. That way you can help support beautiful, amazing, rich. I mean, this is rich. This is like, like, like rich dark chocolate cake rich you know, kind of conversations that we're having today. And we want to be able to do more of that. So again, definitely become a member of the Livestock Conservancy. Uh, John, dude, I love you, man. And I, you have been inspirational to me. Um, and I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for uh, you know <laughs> coming on to my my uh, marketing Monday, my my, my baby, my baby, um, and really giving us the support that we need. Uh, much appreciated, much love, uh, and I, God bless you, dude. I, I just love you. I won't leave it at that. You know, otherwise I can talk for another hour about how much I love you. But again, guys, um, you want more people like this? We're going to have more people like this. Come check us out. Uh, every um, last Monday for Marketing Monday. Next month, uh, we are not going to have Marketing Monday. But June, yeah, June, we will have another Marketing Monday. Um, so be looking out for that. That will be Cattle Month. Next month is going to be International Breed Month of the Week. Yes! So we're going to have people from literally around the world that are going to talk about uh, the breeds that they're working with internationally so if you're interested in that definitely check us out 
next month. We have some amazing, great content and speakers who are going to be coming in for that. Uh, and um, also, Brittany, uh, I don't know if the emails went out uh, yet, but we're also going to do some brief association training. Uh, yes. Jeanette Beringer and myself are going to be doing, uh, I think, about two to three hour uh, training. They'll be live. Um, so definitely, if you're interested in that, if you have a breathe association or interested in starting a breathe association, uh, but wanting to just simply learn more about breathe associations and how to how to have a functional one, really good, high quality one, uh, definitely check us out for our training. Um, check your emails; you might have gotten it, especially if you're a member. Uh, if not, come reach out to me or Brittany. Uh, we can give you more details about that. Uh, but other than that, y'all have a blessed day. Thank y'all for being here. John, again, thank you for being here. Thank you, Brittany, for your awesome work. Um, we're going to call it a day, and uh, we hope y'all have a good day. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Awesome. We'll see y'all later. Take care.